Hi, welcome to Oxford Vineyard and to our Sunday gathering. My name's Andrew, Mandy and I lead this church and we're delighted to be able to welcome you today. For this week and the two following weeks we are having TED Talks between five and ten minutes long roughly and uh, the idea of this is to cover six subjects that would come under the heading of spiritual practices or spiritual exercises, things that will really help us to draw closer to Jesus and know him more and to be able to see that happen in everyday life and not just you know on a Sunday or in our meetings. So this week we have Ed and Louis. Ed hasn't done one of these before but you'll be familiar with Louis anyway. So before they do that let's pray together. Father we ask that you'd come, that you would send your Holy Spirit upon us, that you would make our hearts ready to hear what you have to say and that you give us the strength, the boldness, the courage, the whatever we need to be able to walk with you this week and to be able to follow you and to put into practice the things that you're speaking to us about. So we welcome you now in Jesus name. After the TED Talks we're going to switch over to Zoom. The link for that will be in the chat on the side. It's also there on the website as well. So I really hope you'll come and join us for a time of worship, a ministry time when we want to give God space to come and do what he wants to do and to receive from him what we need. And then we'll break into smaller groups, a bit like standing around the coffee table at the end of the meeting. And it's an opportunity to be able to chat together and also to be able to pray for each other. Hi everyone, good morning. Um, I'm going to be talking a bit about worship this morning um, and authenticity in worship. Uh, and I'm sort of, I'm approaching it specifically from a sung worship point of view, um, but hopefully you can take this uh, and, and apply it to however you worship, whether it be writing poetry or baking cakes or dancing or, you know, whatever it may be. Um, so I want to start off by just talking about, well, why do we worship? And um, a couple of months ago, we were sort of talking about uh, the danger of, of treating worship like a drug and about um, that sort of spiritual fix that you're looking for that makes you feel good for a while. Um, and then you go on living the rest of your life and then you sort of start to feel a bit down and so you come back for another spiritual fix and uh, the danger of making worship about us and how we respond to it rather than about God. Um, and really, why do we worship should be a really simple answer. We worship because God is worthy of our worship and it really doesn't matter what we gain from him at all. Um, you know, however we're feeling, God is worthy of worship. And I know that sometimes it's more complicated than that, um, but, re but really it shouldn't be. You know, um, if it becomes about what are we getting out of worship, um, then we're putting ourselves ahead of God in terms of our priorities. God is worthy of your worship, whether you feel like it or not. And that brings up the question, okay, well, but what if I don't feel like worshipping? Um, and that's where I want to start talking about authenticity. So um, when John Wimble was designing the vineyard person, I'm sure some of you have seen it, um, worship was one of the core facets. And authenticity in worship is a really important part of that. Um, you know, we have this concept of come as you are, um, and, you know, that's sufficient. God takes us as we are. He's interested in us. He's interested in our authentic praise. He doesn't want us to be putting on, you know, a fake smile and um, screaming out praise if that's not how we're feeling. There's absolutely a place for lamentation in your worship. If you look in the Bible, there's even a book called Lamentations. There's absolutely a place for that. What God desires of us is that we turn up and we give him what we have. And sometimes that may be, you know, standing there mumbling along. Sometimes that might be lifting up a hand where normally you wouldn't. Um, you know, whatever it might look like, God wants us to be authentic in, in, in what we're doing. He's not asking us to be anything that we're not. 
Um, it's part of the come as you are. There's a caveat to that. <laughs> it's don't leave as you came. Okay. Um, so come as you are. You might start off mumbling. Okay. And if you but you need to be aware of where you're coming from, so that you make sure that you don't leave in the same situation. And one of the amazing things about worship is if we genuinely bring our praise, God will turn that back round on us and we will get something from worship. But that isn't why we worship. Um, there's a really beautiful verse in um, Psalms 126 verse 3 that says, Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. And there are a lot of contexts that you can put this into, but if we're looking at it in terms of, of worship, you know, that idea of lamentation and that idea of come as you are, those who plant in tears, that's that's where it is. You know, that's t that's the turning up. But the promise is that we will harvest with shouts of joy. And I think particularly at a time where we're worshipping over Zoom um, and, you know, we've been going through this plague year, as some people have been calling it, you know, a lot of people are approaching worship from that place of lamentation, from that place of, you know, Lord, I really don't have that much left to give. And that's fine. Um, if we come as we are, if we give what we've got, if we plant in those tears, we will harvest with shouts of joy. Um, so I want to just challenge you this morning. Um, are you showing up? But be encouraged as well. Whatever we have to give is sufficient and God is interested in us and our authentic praise and he will reward us for that. Those who plant in tears will harvest with shouts of joy. Well, good morning, everybody. So uh, today's subject is fasting. And one of the most common questions you'll hear about fasting is, do we have to? Why should we fast? So without further ado, let's look at 2 Chronicles 20, where we see a fantastic example of cause and effect by fasting. Uh, it's the story of the king of Judah, King Jehoshaphat. How do you like to be called that? And how he responds to a very ugly and urgent situation. And it says the Moabites, Ammonites and Meunites, three nations had clubbed together and were coming to wage war against Jehoshaphat. Some people came and told him a vast army is coming against you from Edom. In fact, it's already on the other side of the Dead Sea in Hazazon Tamar. Alarmed, Jehoshaphat resolved to inquire of the Lord and he proclaimed a fast for all Judah. The people of Judah came together to seek help from the Lord. Indeed, they came from every town in Judah to seek him. God then speaks to a prophet to the king and tells him that God will give the king a great victory. And what a victory it is. Israel ends up not even going to war. Let's see what happens in verse 24. When the men of Judah came to the place that overlooks the desert and looked towards the vast army, they saw only dead bodies lying on the ground. No one had escaped. There was so much plunder, it took three days to collect it. On the fourth day, they assembled in the Valley of Praise, where they praised the Lord. And this is why it is called the Valley of Praise to this day. So this story of fasting ends with a victory in which Israel doesn't even have to fight. God himself had turned the three enemy nations against each other. Now we'll come back to it in a moment, but while that is an example of national fasting, there are other more individual reasons for fasting that are shown in the Bible. For instance, you might be seeking um, direction from God for a very important life decision you have to make, or you might not have received an answer to prayer that you really need. You could be really needed to change something about yourself or your circumstances. Or it might be that you're needing to fast on behalf of somebody else, a family member who is um, in the grip of a very heavy burden or addiction or illness. And you need to receive insight into that situation to know what to do and how to get freedom for them. Now, if any of those resonate with you, whatever it is, you probably have tried to fix it and found that you couldn't. Rick Warren, he's a wonderful pastor in the US, he said, I have been in ministry for about 45 years. And what I've learned 
is that breakthroughs happen generally when you seek them. They don't happen spontaneously. I've talked to hundreds of people who were stuck and in order to get that breakthrough, they had to do certain specific things to seek it. Now in the Bible, anytime anyone needed any kind of a breakthrough, they would always seek God through prayer and fasting, always. There are some examples here. Moses fasted while preparing to uh, receive the Ten Commandments. Elijah fasted when he was in physical danger. Esther fasted for the safety of the Jews. Daniel fasted for revelation and for an answer to prayer. So did David. Jesus fasted for uh, embarking upon his earthly ministry. So it was standard procedure in those days to do this thing. And if we go back to that scripture in 2 Chronicles 20, Jehoshaphat has got this vast murderous horde careering towards him and his people. It must have been absolutely terrifying. And it says in verse three, he was afraid and alarmed. It's a very natural reaction to be afraid of your circumstances when you can't actually fix them yourself. But notice here that he doesn't stay afraid. He does what great leaders do and actually what we can do as well, which is that he resolves, resolves to switch from being focused on that nightmare problem to being focused on God. It's that word resolve. If you are stuck in your um, situation, God is throwing you a lifeline here. He's saying that if you decide to, you can break that hopelessness and powerlessness in your situation, but you have to switch your mind. You've got to decide that what you're going to do is focus on seeking God. Now, there are some very hopeless situations that we face in life sometimes, and yet here we are being asked to give up our right to despair and feeling that life is against us. Instead, what we have to say, whether we feel like it or not, is God, we trust that you are going to change something here and we understand that you get to do this on your own timetable and not ours. So we're going to trust you even when you haven't done this thing for us in the past in the way that we were expecting you to. Now that's a tough call and it takes a lot of mental energy to um, engineer the hope again uh, to put yourself in that posture and position. But that is what is required and nothing less. Back to Jehoshaphat. The next verse says he proclaimed a fast for everybody. Why? Why couldn't he have just prayed about it and asked everybody else to do the same? Well, the first reason is that he was calling a national fast because the whole nation was under attack. There are other reasons, though. Um, sheer obedience is one of them. Unquestioning obedience is very powerful. Bill Johnson makes an insightful point too. He says there's something about fasting that helps to explain the idea that physical obedience brings about a spiritual release. There's somehow a connection between what we do physically in the natural here and what happens in the unseen world. He goes on, unfortunately, the Western church has become very concept orientated. Things get reduced to an inward feeling and not a physical action. Like, you know, I feel humble, so why should I kneel? Or I feel happy, why should I dance? I have an attitude of faith, why should I take risks or fast? And everything is reduced to this internal state that really needs to be more outwardly manif manifest. Going on a fast sends a message. It says, God, we're serious about this. You've got our attention. We mean business about not staying in this condition. There's a famous quote from C.S. Lewis where he says, God whispers to us in our pleasures. He speaks to us in our conscience and he shouts to us in our pain. It is his megaphone to rouse a deaf world. And that's what's going on here. So in the story, Jehoshaphat was calling for a fast from food. Now you can fast from all sorts of things, you could fast from your mobile for a day, from Facebook, Instagram, food, TV, alcohol, sex, coffee, treats. The things you need to fast from is the thing that's got a hold on you 
It's the thing that you're giving more affection to than you should. There's no getting around the fact that fasting is difficult. It's in fact the whole point. It's meant to be sacrificial. We have to face the discomfort of going out, going without, and that is particularly difficult in a world where we get to have normally what we want the moment we want it. But you need to know that there is so much compassion and encouragement for you if you're struggling with your physical appetites or circumstances that are out of whack. Um, it's part of a genuine friendship with God that we must tell him what has broken us inside. But just a, a little word of warning, which is that we need to keep our antennae out to check that we haven't crossed that line into self-pity. I think it's OK to have a little moan. I often do. But <clears throat> don't keep on moaning. There's a right way and a wrong way to focus on God. And God wants us to respond to him in the right way before he will act. So it's important to get that straight because fasting is such a powerful tool. But it has to go hand in hand with a relationship with God that is free of resentment and a hard done by attitude because God doesn't owe us anything. Now, let's look at what your fasting achieves. So many things, but let's look at three. First of all, it um, gives back quite fast self-control of appetites that have become uncontrollable. The old fashioned term for it is subduing the flesh. Isaiah 58 says, is this not the kind of fasting that I've chosen to set the oppressed free and break every yoke? Sometimes we need to have a broke, uh, a yoke broken, not a broke yoke, and that's a different thing. If we've lost control in an area, whatever it is, if we can't find the strength to say no, that's a kind of addiction. Um, sin is an addiction, it's described like that. And it's something that we need to be set free from. And Jesus is in the setting free business. So forget the idea of handling it yourself. It's too strong for you. Addictions need to be broken and fasting will absolutely help that happen. I should warn you that an unsubmitted appetite is often fueled by an unsubmitted mind. And your mind will kick back very hard at the thought of giving up the one thing you can't do without. But there is all the grace in the world if you will just be prepared to try. Don't worry if you fail, just jump back on. The second thing that fasting gives you is real freedom. Freedom is being able to have whatever it is or not have it, be fine with that either way. It's great to feel in control of those decisions again. Now, there are some addiction recoveries where you get your life back in control, but you won't achieve total freedom in this lifetime. So alcoholism, nicotine, drugs, sexual addictions need an ongoing lifelong fast as part of their recovery. You can't choose to have them one day and then not the next. St. Paul told us in Galatians 5.1, it is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then and don't let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. So what's the third thing that fasting does? It makes your prayers highly effective. Look at that roll call that we were listing earlier on. Moses, Elijah, Esther, David, Jehoph Je Jehoshaphat. I'm going to call him Jehoshaphati from now on. There may have been perfect, may not have been perfect people. They probably had their faults. Uh, but when you look at the answers to prayer and fasting in their life, it is success story after success story. And you and I can have that. There are many godly Christian leaders who fast regularly their whole lives. And, you know, they all say the same thing, that they recognise that fasting was absolutely central to any effectiveness they had as a leader. So self-esteem, freedom, effectiveness, they are among the benefits that God wants us to enjoy. And there are many other benefits. Healing and revelation into your situation are two more that we'll look at another time. But let's finish by being reminded that Jesus said in John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill and destroy your life. But I have come that you might have life 
and have it to the full.